Okay, um, welcome everyone to uh, my presentation about a entirely different topic, uh, which is uh, well something that starts with an acronym, so it must be coming from the telecom world. It's called TTCN3 um, uh, and Eclipse Titan uh, for testing protocol stacks. It's a topic uh, that I have been uh, uh, investigating for quite some time um, and uh, not so much in the context of the protocols you find in the kernel, uh, as I'm not really working much on the kernel anymore, uh, but uh, in terms of protocols that I implement in user space in, in many other areas of, of communication systems. And uh, I'd like to share some of these experiences and introduce this language to you because I think it ha really has a, a very large potential of um, uh, helping in, in testing of uh, protocol stacks. So, well, why do we need testing? I think that's sort of obvious, but, uh, well, some people want to check conformance uh, to specifications. They want to ensure interoperability. Um, they want to uh, look at network security uh, or ensure that uh, this regression testing, of course, and um, uh, performance testing, uh, last but not least. Now, um, of course, there is no single standard methodology or language or approach or tool uh, that people use for testing. Um, you can test your implementation against another copy of your implementation that only works for symmetric protocols, which, well, in, in, in the IP world, we have many of them. In the world that I spend my time, we don't have so many of them. Um, and it doesn't cover a lot of the problems, of course, because if you bug in, in your implementation and you test against your implementation on the other end, they both are buggy and they talk to each other, but still you're not compatible with the spec. You can do like manual testing and look at the Wireshark dissection. That's often very misleading because Wireshark is extremely tolerant and, and buggy, of course, as well, but uh, way too tolerant in terms of what it decodes as valid messages in many protocol dissectors. So it shows you that it's fine, but in reality it's, it's not. So that's also not a very uh, useful approach. Um, people come up with custom implementations of uh, their respective protocols, uh, for example in, in, in Python using SCAPI or other frameworks, um, or in Erlang because it has an exceptionally nice uh, binary encoder decoder how you can express uh, binary uh, messages in there, or other languages of course, and as specific tools like Packetrill, which all have their um, uh, upsides and downsides, and uh, for sure they have use cases. Um, but um, anyway, I'd like to share something uh, with you that's uh, different from all of these tools. So um, during the past couple of years, after I didn't have time for NetFilter anymore, I implemented tons of telecom protocols and, and stacks of those protocols at Osmocom. Um, and I was looking for better tools to help automatic testing. And uh, the interest here is primarily functional testing. It's not so much performance testing in our case, because, well, this is signaling protocols and, and the kind of systems we look at, we're not talking about millions of signaling message per, per, per second or something. It's rather low signaling rates. So performance testing was not the focus. And, well, an ideal testing tool, what would it do? It would allow you to do have a very productive and expressive way to describe your protocol encoding and, and other uh, parameters of the protocol and it would allow extremely convenient uh, pattern matching of incoming messages because the common problem, I mean, sending a, a certain hard-coded message is easy, but then matching on incoming messages uh, based on certain patterns or rules uh, it becomes uh, more difficult. And of course, it has to allow exchange of messages asynchronously with the implementation under test and also have probably other features. And I stumbled on something called TTC and 3 occasionally um, while reading telecom specs. Um, and I investigated um, and uh, I found out it's a, a domain specific language that's just uh, made for protocol conformance tests. Um, history actually goes back to 83, so it's as old as all of the other protocols I look into. Um, but the TTC and 3 as like with 3 as a version uh, is actually from 2000, so it's not all that old. Um, used extensively in the telecom sector. Um, there's not so much um, open source uh, uh, like code that you could find and of course not on Stack Overflow or, or other websites. I mean, it's basically, it's a rather niche language, so, uh, but you can find lots of papers where um, uh, developers at uh, Ericsson, Nokia and other large uh, telecom vendors uh, describe how much and uh, they have actually been implementing in this programming language in order to test their various um, uh, implementations. And ETSI, um, uh, the European Telecommunication Standardization Institute, has actually published abstract test suites written in TTCN3 for protocols like IPv6, SIP, Diameter, 
uh, for electronic passports, digital mobile radio, uh, excuse my typos, I'm always bad with typos, um, six low pan um, and other standards bodies uh, for other focus areas, the industries uh, publish test suits for uh, co-op, uh, MQTT, MOST, which is automotive, or AutoSAR is also an automotive uh, um, uh, protocol. Um, one of the problems has been it's nice that you have a test suite uh, uh, for conformance testing uh, if you don't have a compiler to actually uh, compile uh, that test suite into anything. Uh, and until 2015, there were no um, free software tools actually or free software compilers out there. Um, so it was rather uninteresting, it's like a theoretic exercise. Um, now, uh, Enter Eclipse Titan. Um, after TTCN3 was specified in uh, 2000, Ericsson has internally developed a TTCN3 toolchain, not only the compiler, but centered around the compiler. And this is what they used internally for testing of all kinds of products, like their SGSNs and their BSCs and MSCs and all the, the telecom network elements. Um, it was developed as proprietary software uh, with commercial licenses available to uh, third parties. Um, has grown into something like 300,000 lines of Java and 1.6 million lines of C++, so it's a rather uh, complex uh, uh, product. Um, and in 2015, for whatever reason, I don't know the details, uh, they decided to uh, release this uh, as an Eclipse project under Eclipse public license. Um, and ever since, it's a normal uh, Eclipse member project. Um, all the source code is maintained in, in, in Git, um, they have uh, uh, forums, uh, they're extremely responsive, you can see all the, the commit history, uh, the developers are, are... So basically, it's not abandoned, it's not a code dump to the community and they disappeared, but they continue to maintain that code base, it's just that they now do that as an open source project under the umbrella of, umbrella of the Eclipse Foundation. Um, and it's not just the compiler itself, but also tons of documentation, like PDF manuals to, to uh, you know, to, to kill people with, um, including also source code for many protocol modules, which uh, we'll look at at some other slides, um, because the compiler, of course, okay, is nice, but then what do I compile? I don't want to rewrite everything from scratch. So they also released a lot of the protocol uh, implementations, at least encoding and decoding, um, and so on. There's also an Eclipse IDE, which I don't use uh, because, well, it's a, it's a GUI tool and I don't really like GUI tools. Um, but the compiler itself is, is a just a command line tool and you use make files just like you use a C compiler. So it's really, uh, you don't need that. But uh, there is also a log viewer and visualization and all kinds of things uh, that some people tend to like. Um, yeah, and last but not least, uh, in Debian and Ubuntu, it's already part of the standard distribution, so you just need an apt-get install Eclipse Titan, and there it is, so no, no weird uh, uh, installation or build from source or something like that. So, okay, we finally have some free software. So, how does the workflow look like? So, we have a human developer that writes some code. It, what the human developer writes is called an ATS. It's, an, it's the source code, it's the abstract test suite, how they call it. Um, and then you call the TTC and 3 compiler that transforms that into C++ sor source code. And then uh, you can link in some other C++ code, of course. So if you have some native functions, let's say some checksum computations or some whatever utility libraries that you like to use because you already have them, you can link them in um, uh, and compile them together with the other C++ that was generated um, using regular GNU uh, G++ and you get the binary test suite, um, which uh, they call an ETS, an executable test suite. Um, so, um, these are basically the terminologies they use in the process. Actually, it's even more nice because it includes a makefile generator. So, actually, it can even generate the makefile and then you run the makefile to compile both your C++ and the TTC and 3 and you get the final executable program and that's it. So, it's really rather easy. Now, let's look a little bit at that language and why I think it's interesting in this context. Um, well, one thing to, I mean, it's obviously from the slide, but let me just add that still before uh, proceeding. You get a binary executable code. It's native code. There's no virtual machine. There is no, um, you know, no interpretation, no scripting or something like that. It's a real native executable um, that, that you execute. And that's um, actually, some people also use it for performance testing. Of course, it depends on the scalability requirements, but it's, it's not like a script or a VM or something like that. Um, okay. Okay. 
So the language itself has a very comprehensive type system, which is important uh, in order to be able to express uh, um, protocols and headers and so on. It has parametric templates, which we'll look into in detail, lots of existing encoders and decoders that help you to uh, productively uh, specify uh, the, the protocol. Um, has a very uh, nice uh, logging framework that will automatically do a lot of things, so you don't even need to write a lot of log statements yourself. Um, you have interesting program control features that I haven't seen in other languages so far. Um, has a built-in notion of test cases, so it's not like a, how can I say, a runtime library or some other abstraction in the programming language that then enables you to write test cases, but actually the language itself has a notion of what's a test suit and what's a test case, and what are verdicts as results of test case and so on. And then you have this executor and uh, runtime uh, uh, part of it that gets linked into your executable um, to run what they call parallel test components. So um, it's not a single threaded, single process necessarily, but you can have multiple parallel processes or even you can have multiple different machines because th where these guys are coming from, uh, an implementation under test is not a software program that they want to test. It's like a hardware rack full of, you know, some proprietary hardware and, and embedded so software and firmware. So if you want to test that, you need like 10 boxes surrounding all the different interfaces of that proprietary hardware, and you want to launch all the, the individual parallel test components on those 10 boxes surrounding your implementation under test and you want to aggregate the results and get that back. And all of this is already built into this runtime, so you don't need to worry about you know, synchronizing and gathering results and uh, all that uh, kind of stuff. Okay, so let's look a bit about the, 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 the types. Um, I mean, of course, there's integers, there's float, there's Boolean, uh, very basic things. There's but then it already starts to get interesting. You have something called bit strings, um, uh, which are of arbitrary length, so they doesn't don't need to uh, be like octet aligned or something. You have octet strings. You also have hex strings, which can have something like five nibbles, so it doesn't have to fill entire bytes. Um, you have uh, character strings. A character string is actually defined as an IA5 alphabet, so you cannot have non-ASCII characters in there. Um, uh, the, the checking will make sure of that. You also have universal strings. Um, you can build structure types from those basic types and kind of can, of course, nest those structure types. Um, and you have, we look at all of this in, in a bit more detail, and you also have a native verdict type, which is quite fun because, well, uh, of course, well, what's a verdict? Verdict is the result of your test. Uh, it can be passed, it can be fail, it can be inconclusive, or it can be error because some runtime error happened. Um, but this type has a special property that it can only deteriorate. So if you ever set it to error or fail and you have later statements in your code that would set it to pass, it just wouldn't, wouldn't happen. So basically, it's very easy um, I to write code um, without having to have proper return paths in all the error cases and so on. All you do is basically, oh, something happened that made this test fail. Okay, now I set my verdict to fail and I don't have to care what other code gets executed after that. It can never make the verdict any better than the fail that it already is. Um, helps a lot in, in, in productivity again. Um, so let's look at the structure types. I mean, yeah, it's just like a struct in C. Oh, interesting uh, 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 shading there going on on the, on the projector. Um, it's just like a C structure uh, in the end, uh, though you have things, uh, for example, like optional members. So you can say there's an optional member in this structure. Um, and uh, then an optional member can, of course, be present or not. And now the question is, of course, well, how does this map to a binary encoding? I mean, it's much more abstract than, than a C struct. So this doesn't specify a memory layout uh, of, of some uh, representation, but it's an, an abstract representation of a structured data type. And of course, you can nest them and so on. You also have unions. Uh, the nice part about the unions is, well, you have a built-in capability of identifying which of the choices inside the unit were taken. There is a, a built-in function called is chosen, so you can say, well, is this member chosen in that union? And you don't have to have an explicit member uh, to express uh, something like that, like you would have in, in C. You would start with a struct that has a, a, a member that says which of your member unions uh, is selected in the end. Um, Another important concept to note is until you have uh, assigned a value to a given variable or a member of a structure type, it's unbound, and uh, unbound is a special value or a special yeah, concept. 
And uh, whenever you need a value, for example, you want to transmit a packet, then of course uh, you need to know exactly which bit at which position and which byte needs to be transmitted. Um, everything must be bound. You cannot have, like in a C structure, some uninitialized memory. Of course, you don't want to transmit something that hasn't been properly initialized. And the, the runtime of this uh, takes care um, that whenever a value is expected, um, and you have any unbound members in your data type or any unbound variables, there will be a runtime I will basically tell you you cannot transmit this or you cannot use this in this context because it has not been fully specified. There are some members or some variables that are not assigned values. And in the case of optional fields, you basically have to say omit. So you have to assign this particular optional uh, structure member. So let's say we're talking about this here, the field one member, you basically have to say my message dot field one equals uh, um, omit to say that this is actually not to be transmitted. It's an optional member that you don't want in this context. Um, so this helps you to catch all kinds of bugs uh, about not properly initializing it. And now it starts to become interesting because you can basically say, well, um, uh, I can subtype. I can create my own types that are specified as subtypes of, of, of some other types. So I can specify as an integer that can only have a range from 1 to 100, or um, it can go up to infinity, or I have a, a set of characters in a, in a certain range or in a certain set, and I can, of course, also um, uh, specify patterns. So I can say, well, uh, I have this data type and it's, it's a carriage line feed terminated string. So it's basically anything followed by uh, a slash r slash n at the end. And then I can use this type in, in all my other uh, development. And whenever a string would not match that, it, it would not match or give a runtime error or something like that. So you don't need to explicitly open code functions to check whether it is in a certain range or whether it is uh, matching a certain pattern. The, the, the system can basically take care of that. You just specify what's um, possible or what's legal for a given data type or for a given uh, um, a member of a structure. Okay, that's subtyping. But now the really exciting part is when you start to look at templates. And now what are templates? Don't think of C++, um, forget about that. Um, the templates here are templates for data types. So in, in testing some kind of network protocol, you send messages, you receive messages, and um, for sending messages, well, it's probably not a strict necessity to have templates. I mean, you can just somehow encode your data and send it off. But if you want to receive, then you want to match incoming packets. And uh, what do you normally do? Well, you, if, if you do that in any other language, you would decode the packet in some way, and then you actually have like handwritten code that checks, well, is this member in a certain permitted range, or is this identifier the number that I'm supposed to expect, and so on. And this again in TTC and 3, um, this, uh, the templates can help you to do this. Because basically you can say, well, I want to have, I want to create a template from such and such a data type, and then I describe um, sort of the the properties of the individual fields, um, and I can say, well, okay, the uh, I don't know, the, the sequence number must be plus one of the last sequence number that I had sent or things like that, and you don't need to open code this. Or you can say there's some members that I don't care because this is like a, I don't know, a transaction number that my peer is allocating and I don't really know what, what he will be allocating, so this can be some any value at this case. So you can describe this in templates. And let's start with some very simple templates here. Let's say, well, okay. Uh, we have a character string that must be either A or B or C, rather simple. Um, you can also have, these examples are from the official documentation, and I really like this near pi value. So it's like 3.14 to 3.15, some float value in between. Um, uh, well, I'm not sure which network protocol would use this, but um, well, they also test other things, uh, not just network protocols. Um, right, yes, fit into one byte, it's a bit stupid, but uh, you can also mix that, so you can say basically, well, an integer value that's 0 to 127 or 200 or 255, so you're not constrained to just ranges or just sets. Um, and you can also do interesting things like bit string templates. So here you see, well, basically, this must be 101101 and some other two bits, but you don't care what those bits are um, uh, with the question uh, mark in there. Um, or in character strings, you can say, well, it's some, something that starts with A and it ends with Z, but what's in between, you don't really care, uh, some, any number of other characters in between. 
Uh, you also have much more, ex I mean, I'm not going to go into all the details of the language here, time is not sufficient, um, but you also have other constructs such as complement, if present, subsets, supersets, and permutations that you can use to, to construct that. And of course, the, f the, the interesting part is when you apply templates to uh, structure types and nested structure types, and also you can have parametric templates. So basically, you say here, well, I have my message type here, and it's the, the old message type from the previous example. You have a couple of fields, and you say, well, I have a, a, a template called tr my template. Well, even without an a, I said typos. Yeah, sorry. Um, and uh, I give some parameter into the template. And then basically I define my template and when I instantiate the template I can give it some arguments, some parameters and those parameters will be put into the template. Um, so we have basically field 1 we don't care, field 2 must be B, O or Q and field 3 will be the, temp uh, the parameter that I passed into the template. So of course I can also all do this by writing explicit code but it's so much more easier if it's, uh, uh, there's some support in the, in the language for this. Now. Now what do you do with the templates? Well, you can use uh, the built-in match function, which is, uh, we can say, well, does this blob of data match whatever template? Um, but actually, this happens automatically at many given points uh, in other statements that the language has. So, uh, for example, a fundamental function like receive, uh, where you think in abstract terms to a, to a Linux or, or C uh, system level developer, think of it as a receive system call, it does in reality something else, but you're receiving some data from some, they call it test port, in your case it might be a socket, um, and you can basically just say, well, receive something that matches the template, and you just pass the template as the argument to the receive, and then this receive call will complete only if data arrives that matches the template, and we will look into how we deal with this in, in, in practice. Um, you also can have hierarchies of template. So you can start with a very generic template that would match any legal message in your protocol, for example, and you can derive more specific uh, messages. So let's say any possible message or a possible uh, acknowledgement message or a possible error message. And then from there you can go deeper and deeper and you can create your hierarchy of more specific templates. So in this example, we have a template that basically says, well, any message type is permitted and uh, whatever other parameter must be bar. Um, and then I can declare another template that modifies the original template. And I say, well, but in this case, for that template, the message type must be 23. And then in your code, you can refer to the different templates um, as you go along. Now, we've spoken a lot of, uh, about these abstract data types and records and structures and so on, but how do I get there? Now, um, somehow we need to come from the concrete binary message that we see in our protocol under test uh, to this abstract data type. TTCN3 specifies um, importing of formal schema definitions for ASN1 specified protocols for um, uh, IDL uh, for XSD, for XML schema definitions, and also for JSON schema definition. That's nice for some protocols that are specified in such uh, definitions, but a lot of the things that people have to deal with are not specified that way. So this is why Titan, this which is the specific implementation of the TTC and 3 compilers, has additional codecs and language extensions for uh, expressing protocols that don't follow any such formal definition. So if you want to implement an IP header or TCP header, there is no, uh, you know, no, no uh, abstract syntax that you can use. So they have two what they call codecs. One is raw and one is text. Uh, the name sort of is self-explanatory. And using these codecs, again, you can... Um, using declarative programming, you can express how a given abstract data is encoded or decoded into binary. So how does this look like? Um, now, this is a good and a bad example. I try to use a protocol that everyone knows here is a UDP header. But then if you look at this like, oh, well, in C, this would be much less code than, than, than here, right? But um, of course, for more, pro more complex protocols with more complex headers and optional fields and TLVs and so on, uh, it's uh, much more simpler. And this illustrates sort of the power, because we start first to define a data type that says, well, it's from 0 to uh, uh, 2 to the power of 16, which is encoded as a 16-bit field, um, as an unsigned value, because there's no s a sign, um, and we use a l a least significant byte ordering in there. I could also specify bit ordering, even if I wanted to, not just byte ordering. 
Um, and then I use this data type to construct a UDP header with a source port, destination port, length field, and checksum. And then I say, well, the field order in this record is most significant uh, a bit, f uh, most significant bit first, and that defines how the individual elements in my record are are, in, uh, are, um, are ordered. And then I define a UDP packet which consists of the header and the payload, and I say basically. Um, with this line here at the bottom, that's actually the key part of oh, yeah, of the entire slide. Um, uh, here at uh, the second last line on the slide, where I say variant header length to header payload length index len. What that does is basically say, well, in the header member of this record, um, uh, we store the length of both the header and the payload into a field called len inside the header. So basically in the substructure which defines the, letter, uh, the header, it has a length field and I want to store the total length of both the header and the packet in there. And I don't need to write any explicit code to do that, it will just do it um, based on this declaration. And this, as I said, this works for much more complex data types um, uh, in, in, in the similar way. Of course now for the checksum, this is where you hit the end of what you can do with declarative programming, so you actually have to have a, a piece of code that validates the checksum, and it can be C++ or it can be TTC and 3 code. Um, here, for example, there's a GRE header. Um, GRE has some bit flags in the beginning that define which other optional members, uh, optional fields later in the header appear. Um, so we have a checksum present bit and an RT present and a key present bit. Uh, so we define that header and of course there's more bits and later we have some octets, uh, protocol type, checksum and so on and some of those are optional like the checksum, the offset and the key are optional. Um, and it's optional not optional as I said, sorry for my typos. Um, so and then we say well the checksum field is present uh, if the csum present bit equals 1 or the RT present bit equals 1. And you can express again these kind of um, uh, conditions upon which a certain optional field must be there or must not be there and the binary raw uh, encoder or decoder will behave accordingly when it uh, decodes the message. So again, no need to, to code uh, explicitly um, functions uh, that uh, iterate over the message or something like that. Now let's look at an example of a text coder. Um, the uh, uh, Text here is um, a small um, sub part of an MGCP uh, example. I chose MGCP because, well, it's one protocol that I implement. Secondly, it's an IETF protocol, even though probably many people don't know it. It's the Media Gateway Control Protocol. I think it's RFC 3455 or something like that. It's uh, specified in text. And using the text uh, encoder capabilities of uh, Titan, we can uh, again declare how this protocol looks like. So we first say, well, there is a verb and it can be whatever. It can be CRCX, MDCX, DLCX, whatever. These are basically verbs of the protocol. And we say, well, it has a text encoding. And um, when I receive something, it's text, uh, sorry, it's case insensitive, the match. But then after receiving it, actually, I want to convert it to uppercase. So all my remaining code inside uh, the test case uh, only deals with uppercase. And I don't need to do like uh, a case uh, insensitive string compares and things like that. I define some other things like a transaction ID, which is a decimal number with one to nine digits of length. Uh, there's an MGCP endpoint, which looks a bit like an email address. So it has some part in front of an at sign and some part after an add sign and so on and so on. And then I construct basically my entire command line and I can specify that there can be spaces or tabs in between and there must be a carriage uh, return line feed termination at the end and so on. So uh, once again, I just express this in, in the syntax of the language and I don't need to write a single line of code to parse or encode this entire text-based protocol. And you could do the same with SMTP, with HTTP, with whatever you want to do, um, not writing uh, any, any code uh, like any normal, like how you would write code in C or other languages. So, program control statements. We have if else, for while do, uh, do while loops, go to uh, and label, we have break and continue, so all that is very much like in C. Uh, the select statement is rather uh, different, um, uh, but it's fundamentally similar to a switch statement in C, so I'm not going to go into details here. We also want to look at some examples still. Um, now, Communications operation. So in the end, we want to send and receive some stuff. And uh, in TTCN3, this works through something called test ports. Now, this 
does not have anything to do with a UDP port or a TCP port. It's, it's a much more abstract concept. A test port could be a serial line, it could be, I don't know, it could be avian carriers. It's basically a very abstract concept. And um, uh, you can then use uh, a test port implementation to map onto whatever that is. So in, in Titan, for example, you have test ports that map onto a packet socket, onto an IP, UDP, TCP, SCTP socket. And in the end, then, you can send and receive data on the port. And uh, for sending, well, you give some value and it performs a non-blocking send and you can have literal values, constants, and so on to send. The receive operation is always blocking in TTC and 3. And no, people will probably have question marks in their head, how can that work? We will look at that. Um, uh, so if the receive blocks, I mean, if it blocks in indefinitely, you want to have some timeout, how do you handle that? Or if you're waiting for like three different things to happen in any random order, but all of the three must happen, how do you do this uh, in, in a blocking receive? Um, so that's an example that illustrates that. So let's assume uh, we want to receive X and Y, um, but we don't know whether X appears before Y or Y appears before X. So doing two blocking receives, of course, wouldn't work in sequence. And so TTC and 3 introduced something called the ALT statement. So you can specify, well, either A or B or C must happen, and then you can um, define the handling. So in this program example here, um, we basically, in the first line, we're sending some request, whatever it may be. We start a timer. We do some other stuff, and then we have an ALT statement. Here we say, well, if on test port P uh, we receive something that matches RESP, where RESP might be a template to match a response uh, uh, according to your spec, then you have a, a block here in, in curly braces of whatever to do uh, if that happens. And it co the control flow then continues after this ALT statement. Or if you receive anything else on any other port, you can define whatever should happen then there. Or if the, a timeout on this timer T, which you started up there, has happened, then you can handle timeout expiry or something like that. Uh, what's in the beginning is a guard statement, uh, which if it's empty is always true. But uh, if you want to have state machines or something, that's rather uh, good because you can match in there, can say, well, uh, any given number of your alt uh, alternatives in the alt only apply if you're in a certain state or something like that. That's what the guard statement is for. Um, we also have repeat. So in again this example, to fill in some stuff, uh, we, well we, we send some request, we start a timer, we wait for something. So either we receive a response where we implement like the intended response or we receive something like a keep alive that's not really part of our test but it's part of the protocol that there's a regular keep alive between client and server going on and we just want to ignore it or we want to respond to it but it shouldn't affect the control flow of our test then we can say well if we receive a keep alive then we repeat so basically this entire alt statement gets um, uh, continued and we don't exit it uh, if a match happens if we receive anything else maybe we abort the test or we fail it in some way um, or if we have timeout then we handle that in some way so that's an, an alt statement um, there is even more fancy concepts now because if you start to write tests uh, in in this way you you send something you have the alt statement and you will find well in uh, in each of my test cases i'm starting a timer and i'm waiting or i have one of the alternatives is the timer expires and if the timer expires my test case should fail and you don't want to write that 100 times if you write 100 different test cases so what you can do and i didn't put this in the example it would go too far but just conceptually you can um, you can have something called a, um, uh, it's called an alt step actually, and you can basically say, well, in my alt statement, I have some, I activate some, some additional things which magically get inserted here, but which I don't have to state every time I'm, I'm writing such an alt statement. So your default timer handling or whatever other handling, like sending a pong in response to a ping uh, that uh, you just have to do to keep the protocol alive, um, you do this in, in what's called an alt step, and that gets activated in all of your alts uh, uh, that you write, so you can abstract all the things that are common to each of the, to all of your test cases or many of the test cases. Now, how do we write code? We write it actually in modules. It's a bit like Python conceptually, if you've done any Python work. So um, uh, you have modules, and you can import uh, certain objects or variables or definitions from other objects using an, an or from other modules using an import statement. You have parameters, data types, communication ports. You define basically all the different things you can import. 
And now, before we go uh, a couple of uh, additional slides, let's look at some uh, example code, actually, how this looks like in, in a real uh, use case. Um, I'm starting at the bottom of the file where I have something called control. That's basically the control statement, which is a default statement uh, that says uh, what are the individual test cases to be executed in this test. You are, um, every TTC and 3 test suite automatically has a configuration file, and with that configuration file, without writing any explicit line of code, um, you can also define, you can override basically what's in that control statement. Another interesting part is, let me just go to the beginning here. Um, I can have module parameters. Now, of course, I don't find them. Anyway, let's, let's ignore that. You, you, ah, module power here, actually, yeah. So here we define, for example, the port numbers and the IP addresses with which our test interacts. I can have some compiled in defaults there, but automatically, because I declared those in the module power section, uh, a text config file can take any of those parameters, and I don't need to write code for parsing a config file for dealing with any of that. It just takes care of that, and I don't need to worry about this. So. Um, uh, this is automatically available in the config file and can be specified when I execute it. Now, um, let's look at some, well, th this is a, a pure function here, get next transaction ID, which just increments a global variable and uh, uh, allocates me a new transaction ID for, for interacting. This is MGCP, the Media Gateway Protocol. Um, I can define just normal functions like in any other programming language, but in the end, and here you see some template definitions. In the end, you come to test cases. Um, so let's actually look at that, for example, the TC self-test. Uh, and TC is test case. It's not uh, related in any way to Jamal. He didn't pay me any uh, secret beers to, to make it called TC. Um, so this is, I'm, I'm defining some strings. These are basically strings that, uh, I'm, I'm self-testing the module here. So these are strings that are valid or invalid or whatever MGCP uh, strings. And I'm just testing um, uh, by calling the decoder. I'm, I'm self-testing the module. But some actual, like real um, test case. Let's um, look at this here. So this is test case that sends uh, a certain message to CRCX to create a connection, um, and it, it tests with some unsupported parameters. So. Um, I call some initialization function. Um, I have here, I basically, I derive a value of uh, MGCP command uh, type uh, from a send template for CRCX where I use the next transaction ID and some other values. And this is a parametric template. So the, the values I put in here, they are basically getting part of a template. And then I initialize some more fields of this uh, command, uh, again using utility templates, uh, so to, to um, uh, have a more abstract definition than, than writing the, the actual native text there. And in the end, I have a helper function that transceives this command and returns uh, a template, and I have a pass here. So basically, where does it fail? Well, uh, this MGCP transceive uh, helper function um, that I'm calling, um, and now I lost the context, sorry for that. Anyway, the MGCP transceiver function, um, it also has access to the, the, the verdict. So any function you call has automatically access to the verdict of the current test case, so it can basically check and match and, and see if something fails or doesn't fail. And actually, let's look at this MGCP receive um, a transceive function for a second. Yeah, um, here we are. So um, this is transceive function. So we have a command that we want to transmit. We have a template which specifies what do we expect in return. And now here we're just patching in some, some transaction ID and in the end we send it. So here we send uh, the, the template um, through uh, the test port. We start a timer, we enter our alt statement and then if we receive something um, that uh, matches MRT, um, 
what MRT uh, is is a, a template that we have derived here. Yes, it's a template. So if we what whatever we we match, then basically we continue here. If we receive something else that is still an, a valid MGCP, we say it's fail because we received something that's not matching our template. If we receive anything else that's not MGCP, we ignore it at this point. If we have a timeout, we fail the test case and so on. And then here we do some additional processing at the bottom. So, um, of course, uh, very difficult to illustrate all the features of such a powerful tool in a very short amount of time, which brings me to the time. Um, two more slides, very quickly. Um, so there's logging support, I already said that. Um, there's help us to format the logs in a very nice way. So um, this would be the log, how it's generated. It looks a bit like JSON. So it will basically, any time you send or receive something, it already dumps you the decoded and the encoded data. And there's some formatting tools that will format and structure it nicely like this for you, which is much more easy to, uh, to understand what uh, is actually going on. Um, and this is just a list of all the protocols that the Titan guys already have implemented for you. Um, so you don't need to restart by creating encoding and decoding of those protocols and you can focus on your actual test cases. And this brings me to the end. I don't want to go too much over time. Uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out uh, to me at any time. Thanks. With a quick question. question. And now what do you have a question? Do you see do you see us using this in the kernel to test some well not in the kernel but to test no, the uh, kernel for yeah, sure yes yeah, yeah. like what yeah. well what I did as a demo at uh, the netfilter workshop this year is I implemented a very simplistic connection tracking testing so basically I opened two ton devices and um, uh, basically sending and receiving packets through the ton devices from my test case and then I implemented a uh, you can link in native code so I um, linked in a libct netlink to query the connection tracking uh, table over a netlink so you can basically send some messages, uh, you send the first packet, and then you read the connection tracking and you verify if it's in the state that you expect. Then you send a response packet, you reread the connection tracking entry, and you match again if now the state change that you expect to happen after the reply packet has arrived um, uh, is there. So I, I've wrote some code that is more in the context of, of what kernel networking people do. I think it's useful even in such cases. Whether any of you guys has time or interest or thinks it's important to do uh, automatic test cases, that's a separate question, but um, I think it's useful in this context, yes. Okay, thanks. We'll give him a warm applause, please.